Hello everyone. So far, we have covered economic value to the customer and willingness to pay. Today, we're going to look at a specific pricing format: auctions. Auctions are a widely used pricing format in real estate development, used car sales, artwork, seafood, and flowers. Specifically, we're going to introduce three topics. First. We'll examine four different types of auctions. Then we'll examine in what sense do these auctions differ, and more interestingly, how are these auctions strategically similar to each other? And finally, we'll look at an interesting phenomenon in auctions. It's called a winner's curse. To start, let's watch a couple of YouTube videos. The first video is the auction of the famous Leonardo da Vinci painting. Salvato Mundi, Savior of the World. The second video is an introduction of a specific auction format widely used in sales of fresh flowers in the Netherlands, and the auction format is named after the country. It's called a Dutch auction. Okay, now you have watched the videos. Let's look at the theory behind the exciting process of auctions. As you may recall, this is an example we used for willingness to pay. When we have multiple customers with different willingness to pays, using the willingness to pay information, we can find out the relationship between price and the number of customers who would be willing to buy the products. That is, we are able to draw the relationship between price and demand. In our example, we had ten customers, and、uh, the line looks like a staircase. But when you increase the number of customers, the staircase would become finer and finer. So eventually, it would actually look like a straight line. This is the demand curve that we will talk about more in this class. Since willingness to pay gives us the demand curve, you may treat each one of these staircases as An individual, and different individuals have different willingness to pay. Therefore, they would buy the product at different prices. So when you look at these people, we can consider that for a customer up here, when the price gets this is a price of zero, when the price gets a little bit higher, these people would drop out of the market. When the price is here. All these three people will drop out of the market, and on this side are the customers with higher willingness to pay numbers. If this is the demand curve, let's say, for a painting, a Mona Lisa in quarantine, which one of these customers? So we have one painting. Which one of these customers here would be able to buy this if we use the auction format? As we have discussed earlier, the customers towards the lower right corner on the demand curve are the ones with higher willingness to pay. If we use an auction format, what we are going to have eventually would be the one customer with the highest willingness to pay in the market. So this is the biggest advantage of auctions. In theory, it is able to extract the perfect willingness to pay information because people with lower willingness to pay. In ascending auction format, would drop out of the market one by one. Eventually, the one left would be the one with the highest willingness to pay. So, when do we use auctions? Here are two commonly used pricing formats: bargaining and auction. For bargaining, usually we have one buyer, one seller, and they can reach one deal. Negotiation table, basically. And for auctions. Usually, the case is we have one seller, only one Mona Lisa, and many potential buyers. So there's one deal. Eventually, the highest bidder gets to keep the product, and this is the most common perspective we、we'll、discuss from auctions. However, auctions can also be used when there is one buyer and multiple sellers. So it's reverse the role of buyers and sellers. And there's one deal, and commonly in that auction format, what we are going to see is government or large corporation procurement program. 
when the government wants to buy something, it buys in a large quantity, and many suppliers may participate in auction, competing to sell the product to the buyer. So in that case, they're not bidding up, they're bidding down because they are competing to sell. So the one, either be the buyer or the seller, is usually the one who gets to set the rules in these auctions. There are several auction formats. As you have seen in the YouTube videos, the auction of Leonardo da Vinci's painting was an English auction. The sale of tulips and fresh flowers in the Netherlands, those are Dutch auctions. And we'll also talk about two other types of auctions. They are called the first price sealed bid auction and the second price sealed bid auction. First, how an English auction works. So this is the format we are most familiar with. We observe ascending prices, so bidders bid up the prices. So bidders openly outcry their prices until there's only one bidder left. A Dutch auction, it does not start from a low price and bid up. It goes the other way around. So the auctioneer would start out at a high price point. And then the clock starts ticking. As the clock tickles down, the price would start to methodologically drop with the clock. So in a Dutch auction, it would look like you get a bunch of people sitting there watching the clock and the price changing without doing anything until someone says, I want it. So at that point, when that person bids, that's the price that the buyer receives. Comparing to English auction, a Dutch auction is very efficient, mainly because a single bid would end the auction, and which is why it is often used to sell fresh products such as uh, in the fish markets in Japan, and similarly, flowers. So when products are perishable, Dutch auction is much more efficient than an English auction. The two other auction formats are what we call sailed bid auctions. The bidders submit sailed bids. That is, pretty much you write down your price and put it in a sailed envelope. And the winner in the first price sealed bid auction is the one with the highest bid. And then you pay for whatever you bid. This auction format is usually used in very large dollar amount transactions. For example, the US Treasury bills, this goes in billions with a B uh, in each transaction. So they use first price sealed bid auction. And uh, uh, very often, supply contracts, for example, a government project, they want supply contracts. And the second type of sealed bid auction is called a second price sealed bid auction. So bidders still submit sealed bids. So each person in these sealed bid auctions, each bidder can only bid once. Whatever you write down is your bid. So bidders submit sealed bids and the winner is still the highest bidder. What's different from first price sale to bid auction is in the second price sale to bid auction, the amount paid is the second highest bid. Let's say you are the highest bidder. You bid a million dollars and the second highest bidder bids, let's say $500,000. And in this case, the bidder who bids a million dollars would win but the winner would only need to pay the second highest bid of $500,000. So this format is used for New Zealand's communication spectrum. At a glance, second price sale bid auction seems to leave a lot of money on the table. How do sale bid auctions work? They are selling auctions. So nobody calls out their bids. There's only one bid for each potential buyer and uh, collusion is usually banned by rule. This is very common for commercial or government contracts. So now let me use the example to discuss how these four different auction formats may actually be somewhat similar to each other. So here's the example. Let's say we are uh, looking at a independent private value auctions. Well, I'll explain private value a little bit later. There are four bidders 
in the market, and their willingness to pay is are one dollar, two dollars, three dollars, and four dollars. So all the bidders know their own willingness to pay, and they also know that the willingness to pay in the market has an equal probability to be between one and four. They don't know the one, two, three, four specific numbers, but they do know the willingness to pay in the markets are in the range between one dollar and four dollars. So let's say you are the seller in this case. What will be the expected revenue from this market when you run an auction using the following different formats: English auction, second price sale bid auction, Dutch auction. Or first price sealed bid auction. For English auction, the optimal bidding strategy for all the bidders except the winner would be to bid their own willingness to pay. So the sequence, as you can imagine in this case, would be: let's say the auction starts at one dollar. At one dollar, all four bidders would bid. And、uh, now the auctioneer starts to raise the price, one fifty. Now you have only three bidders left. The ones with willingness to pay is two dollars, three dollars, and four dollars. So the price goes up and up until at the point when the price goes to three dollars. At that point, two bidders are left, and then once the price goes above three, let's say in this case the incremental is one cent. Once the price goes to three dollars and one cent, and then There is only one bidder left, so the one with a willingness to pay of four dollars would pay three dollars and one cent for the product, and that bidder is the winner. In this case, the revenue for the seller is three dollars and one cent. Okay, now what happens to a second price sale bid auction? Here, the optimal bidding strategy for all the bidders is to bid their own willingness to pay. The advantage of second price sale to bid auction is it actually protects the bidder with the highest willingness to pay. It also eliminates the necessity to speculate about how the willingness to pays are distributed in the market, because the highest bidder in this case will not get stuck with overbidding. Let's say everybody bids their willingness to pay. That will be one, two, three, and four dollars. And the winner would be the one with a willingness to pay of four dollars, and the winner only pays the second highest bid. In this case, it will be three dollars. So let's say the incremental value again is one cent. Then the winner would only need to pay three dollars and one cent. So as you see, interestingly, an English auction and a second price sale to bid auction would actually lead to the same revenue. And the bidding strategy is the same except for the highest bidders. Now let's consider the other two auction formats: a Dutch auction and a first price sale bid auction. So, should the bidder in a Dutch auction or in a first price sale bid auction bid their own willingness to pay? It's an interesting question. Let's think about it. The bidders know these auction formats. The bidders also know that, for example, in a Dutch auction, if the bidder bids their willingness to pay, the highest willingness to pay bidder would almost surely overpay because the second highest willingness to pay would still be on average a dollar away. So, what would bidders do in these cases? A rational bidder in a Dutch auction would actually hold a little bit longer rather than bidding their own willingness to pay. As a result, it actually leads to underbidding, bidding below willingness to pay in a Dutch auction. Similarly, in a first price sale bid auction, to avoid overpaying, bidders also tend to bid below their willingness to pay in order to avoid getting stuck with the highest bid and far away from the second highest bid. The decision process in these two cases are actually fairly complicated. They can be estimated using probability theory. The result is that if the bidders are fully rational, the expected revenue for the buyer would be identical in a Dutch, English first price and second price sales bid auctions. 
they would all be three dollars and one cents. That is right above the second highest willingness to pay. And for the first price and the Dutch auctions, that's because all the bidders would rationally bid down to avoid overbidding for the products. Interesting, huh? So now let me circle back to talk about private value versus common value auctions. So in a private value auction, everybody knows his or her valuation of the product. And that valuation is not correlated to everybody else's valuation. So common value auctions are the opposite. In a common value auction, the value of the products on sale is the same for everyone. So it's common. The value is common for all the bidders. Although this value may not be known. An example would be something like an oil field. Let's say in Western Texas, we have found a piece of land in the Permian Basin. And under this piece of land, the amount of oil and gas reserve is the same no matter who wins the auction. And uh, an interesting phenomena is what we call a winner's curse in a common value auction. That is, the winner of a common value auction, generally speaking, would lose money when they win. Why does this happen? It goes back to common value auctions. The two characteristics of common value auctions is the product, or in this case, the oil field for sale, has an objective common value for everyone. That's number one. Number two, this value, although it's there, it is also unknown. So everybody has to guess this value. And let's say people's guesses are not so bad. So let's say it's kind of a normal distribution bell-shaped valuation. In the center, it would be the actual objective value. And on both tails, some bidders underestimate the value. On the other hand, some bidders overestimate the value. And on average, these bidders may get the correct value. And then, if all of them participate in this oil field auction, what happens? Who's going to win? That's right. The bidders who overvalue this oil field would win. That is why in a common value auction, often the winner actually would lose money because they overbid. How do we avoid the situation then? Commonly, in an auction like this, bidders would intentionally bid below their valuation Let's say you go to bid on oil field, your estimated value of the reserve is $10 billion. And these professional bidders, based on their experience and the historical data, would intentionally bid down. Although they value it at $10 billion, they will not bid above, let's say, $8 billion. So they always bid at least 20% below their willingness to pay. The general strategy in a common value auction is the less information you have about the product, the lower you should bid. The more uncertain you are about the valuation, the lower you should bid. And finally, the more bidders there are out there, the lower you should bid. That's all about a winner's curse. As a direct application of this phenomena, my final question for you is, how much do you think the Astros should bid for him? That's all for auctions. Thank you. I'll see you next time.